I'm Deb Campbell, and I'm going to be reading to you from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those in his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by God, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those who were at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devils and angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, When was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That was a reading, huh? Let's pray. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that our eyes may be enlightened, that our hearts may be open, and that we may know the hope to which we have been called. Amen. So every pastor needs to do children's circles at least every once in a while because they keep you honest. One of the coolest things that's happened to me in the past few months is that my 13-year-old son has started getting Christian TikToks. Yeah. <laughs> He's been taking notes on some points to bring to me. Yeah, he is. And I'm thrilled about this because I don't get tired of talking about this stuff. And it's nice to have someone else who isn't tired of hearing me talk about it quite yet. But it's also really fun to talk through things with a 13-year-old. Like, it's really fun to do children's moments because their BS meters are really high. And it's also really fun to see how well I understand the concepts that I profess to live by. A major thing that Jackson and I spend time talking about are the different translations of the Bible. And, as Margaret Amer said in, in seminary class, every translation is an interpretation. The different word choices really can affect the biases of the translator 
and what they are trying to accomplish in their work. And this reading is one of the majorly loaded texts that really require some careful reading. It's taken almost for granted in a lot of other churches that this reading emphasizes Jesus as the king, as the son of man in the Hebrew Bible, one who will come back in glory with angels and trumpets and a throne. But none of those things are explicitly Jesus in this text. And in fact, I suspect that if we're able to lower our hackles enough to hear this text, not used as a power play reminder that someday we will likely burn, let's consider what we can find in here. I imagine, in fact, that this text is a beautifully subversive way of calling out folks who might use texts to terrify and control. This reveals something very interesting. The Son of Man, whomever that might be, does not mention salvation as a sorting criteria. The sinner's prayer isn't mentioned one time. There are not those who have the right theories of who God is and what Jesus was and how we properly celebrate and worship and pray. There's not those that got it so wrong that they are shamed. There are those who did the right thing for people in need, and there are those who did not. And those who did not are shocked. They wonder when they saw this king, this son of man, hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, in prison. Because they were convinced that they knew who the son of man was. And they're convinced that they've got the highest and most noble understanding of what everyone needs. They're the ones who are certain they know who's back they need to scratch to get ahead. And they're the ones who carry the fear of and belief in being accursed and eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Those who were named unrighteous, the goats, and by the way, I am actively restraining myself from making a Jesus was a Capricorn joke. Those unrighteous know their deeds. They've kept score of every encounter. They know precisely how many hungry mouths they may have fed and the exact how and when of each good deed done in their lives. And in fact, the unrighteous are so convinced of their righteousness that they cannot imagine good would even exist in the world were it not for them. These are the people who will remind you of everything they have made possible, those who demand gratitude or praise, those who are almost pathological in their attempts to be saved from their own personal hell, not of fire, but of low self-esteem, of lack of meaning. I suspect that by placing their desire for affirmation above their desire for love, they have overlooked the Christ figure, the centering of themselves overshadowing the work that they accomplished, and indeed they are not to be cast into fire because they are already in hell. We all know folks like this. And Jesus reminds us that those who profess perfect understanding and action are very likely the ones who don't understand or act on his message at all. They don't understand that we cannot be saved by our own egos. That we don't avoid hell by raising ourselves up and keeping score. And in fact, keeping score and raising ourselves up is but the opposite is also true. The righteous start out this story, and they 
are also surprised. These sheep sorted on the right hand, they're shocked because they have done the right thing to their fellow human beings without concern for the importance of the person they're helping, without regard for how they might be helped in return. The righteous are shocked that they'd ever even encountered the Son of Man. They just righted wrongs to the best of their ability. Because what is eternal life, if not the ability that other people might have to recount the differences that you made in their lives? So we have the sheep and the goats, We have the people who do the good things and keep score of the good things, and we have the people who do the good things just because they found the opportunity. We have the righteous, and we have the unrighteous, but more than anything in this story, we have another opportunity as readers to judge people according to which side we might think they're on. And I think that if we spend too much time assuming that we are sheep, we might find ourselves as goats. So what if we step away from centering ourselves in this text? How about we save ourselves from the burning of self-centeredness and allow ourselves to relax into the blissful surprise of how we are, beloved community, right now. Because it is easy to lean into the goat and sheep divisions, the binaries, and wonder if you are one of them and which one you might be and which one someone you really like or you really dislike might be. But the key is to focus on all folks and how we love each other. The hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, the sheep, and the goats. The point is that we respond with mercy, not with judgment. Not with our hearts turned to optics, but instead with compassion and with integrity. The fact that surprised both the righteous and the unrighteous in this story is that they met God in the face of their neighbor. They met God in acts of mercy and service, and they sought to serve. The comfort that I've been able to find in the liberating message of this Jesus figure is fully encapsulated in this story, even as it has been used to coax loathing and fear. But indeed, the comfort of the message of Jesus is that we have nothing to fear. We don't have to fear being goats or going to hell. We don't have to fear our sexual orientation or our gender identity or even death. The comfort of this story is that we are not alone and that the seeking of justice and love is our identity. I think that what continually surprises me about spiritual community and about the nature of divinity and the ways in which we are all called to discern these paths, is that God still meets us in acts of mercy and of service. God meets us in the faces of our fellow human beings. God meets us in this beloved community, which is bigger than the sum of its parts. Indeed, this community is something entirely unbreakable, even though it is formed by inevitably splintered human beings. And siblings, these circumstances may not be where we expect to find divinity, but as always, the divine shows up exactly when we aren't even thinking about looking for her. She is in the mercy and the grace 
however small, that we are offered and that we are able to extend in all of our interactions. Friends, I am grateful beyond measure that you have invited me to participate in this community. And I'm surprised still every time that any of us are saved from our own navel-gazing and coaxed into real relationships, when we are delighted in our encounters with the divine in the here and the now. And siblings, let's go out and be that surprise. Let's be that mercy, that delight, that love. Let's be that good news in the world. Amen.